Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Joey Stewart, and I'm the executive director for RYM and been doing this for the last eight years. I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, born in Mobile, Alabama. No one? Thank you. And um, yeah, and so I spent kind of, you know, five years as a youth minister in Yazoo City, Mississippi. Yeah, very good. All right. Nice. Yeah. Who's the most famous person from Yazoo City, Mississippi? Besides me. Uh, not you. Hey, Some Madison. guy what? I'm from Madison, but... You're from Madison? You don't know the answer to this? <laughs> Do you know? He's, a, he's an old comedian. Oh, uh, Red Skelton? No, Red Skelton. That's really old, dude. Yeah, it's... No, uh, Jerry Clower. Y'all remember that name? No. Yeah, Jerry Clower. Yeah. <laughs> Jerry Clower Boulevard is right down the middle of the Azu City. So, yeah, I spent five years there, and then I moved to Cookville, Tennessee, where I planted a church, and I was the pastor of that church for 14 years. And then uh, I, t I accepted a call to become the executive director for RYM after that. So I've been on the board of directors for RYM for now 25 years. And today is also my 25th anniversary. How that, Marvin? Yeah, the silver. You need to applaud for my wife as you need to applaud for her. Uh, she's hung with me this long. So, yeah, it's a good day for us in that regard. Okay, so the name of this class is called what? Oh, so nobody knows. That's not going to work. Hold on, I'm just going to take a little bit to find the right marker. Yeah, the name of the class is Making Sense of the struggle. That's the class, okay? All right, before we get into what we're going to talk, talk about, can I have somebody close the blinds in the back so I don't get blinded by the light? Not to quote an old 80s song, but we'll do that if you can close that down. Hey, I'm really glad you guys are here this week. My favorite conference of all the conferences we do with RYM is this one. I love Middle School Florida the most. And uh, I'm really looking forward to teaching you guys this week. Uh, so before we get into it, why don't we have a word of prayer? Who would volunteer to pray for us? Anybody? Go. Good. Father, thank you for bringing us all here together this morning uh, to spend time learning more about you. Uh, we pray that you would be with Joey and speak through him. Uh, please use him uh, to point us toward you. We love you, Father, and we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. All right, let me ask you this. Are you dominated by guilt over your sins in your life? Do you struggle with feeling like you never measure up spiritually, like you're always enslaved to the sins in your life. And in fact, when you look at the sins in your life, do you ever wonder, am I even really a Christian? When you look at Christianity, do you see it as this collection of great and true ideas, right? But you feel like they're almost impossible for you to live out consistently and practically in your everyday life. Do you tend to look at God more as a harsh drill sergeant than your loving Heavenly Father? If that's true of you, if any of it's true of you, if you're trying to make sense of the struggle that you're in, then you've come to the right place. This class is for you. This class is for strugglers. For strugglers like me. Right? People who struggle with God. People who struggle with their sin, with guilt, with life, with themselves. That's who this class is for. I wonder in your life, do you really believe that God is for you? Do you really believe that He loves you, treasures you, delights in you? Or down deep, do you really believe, do you struggle with believing God's against me. He's not really for me. How many of you like art? Anybody? Ever been to an art museum? You know, maybe you were younger and your mother and your grandmother said, you're going to get some culture. 
today, right? We're going to the museum. And so they drag you kicking and screaming into the museum. And you walk into this museum and there's these different rooms. And you go into the first room, which is the European Classics room. And you see there hanging on the walls, you know, the Mona Lisa, all these paintings by Rembrandt. And as you're walking through this room, you're just thinking to yourself, I wish I was anywhere on the planet but here. I am bored to death. And so then you go into the next room, which is the ancient Rome room, right? Now, what kind of art do you think is in the ancient Rome room? Uh, what do you think? Yeah. Pictures of battles. Pictures of battles, sure. Greek mythology. Mythology, very good. Anybody else? Sculptures. Sculptures. Okay, what kind of sculptures do you find in the ancient Rome room? Like parts of like castles and stuff, like, like Parts of castles and stuff, yeah, maybe. Zeus. Zeus, okay. I can tell you like mythology. What what are you? Roman versions of the Greek gods. Okay, Roman versions of Greek gods. Anybody else? Naked, right. naked people. Okay, here we go. This is what you find in the ancient Rome room. There are sculptures of naked people everywhere, right? Oh, yeah. Naked men, naked women, naked children. And you're in there with your grandmother. And you're just kind of going, please, Jesus. Jesus, get me out of here. And she's thinking, I have never. She's offended by all that she's seeing in the naked Rome room. <laughs> so then you go into the third room, and it's the modern art room. And this is a room filled with paintings on the wall, and they all look like Walt Disney threw up. Every one of them. <laughs> and you're standing there next to this other guy, and he's just weeping. He's crying and he's saying, I see it. I see the heart of the artist. I get what he's communicating to me. And you're just thinking to yourself, you, know, you kind of look at it and you look at him and you look back and you're saying, that's the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. A two-year-old could scribble that. <laughs> well, this week, what we're going to do is paint a picture. And you're going to have different responses to this picture that we're going to paint. Some of you are going to look at it and you're going to think, man, I am just bored to death. I would rather be anywhere but here. Others of you are going to look at it and you're going to think, I'm offended by what Joey is saying. I'm offended by this picture that he's painting because it's going to say some things about you that you don't like. Others of you are going to look at this picture and you're going to think, man, that's just the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. But some of you, and it's my prayer that all of you will be consumed with an appreciation for the artist's work and will see, perhaps for the first time, its immeasurable beauty and value. Gang, I've been looking at this painting for 37 years. And it's still the most amazing thing I've ever laid eyes on. So what I want us to do today is put the frame to our picture together. And we're calling the frame the demand. The demand. That's where we're headed today. Now let me set the ground rules before we begin. Okay? Everybody's got a blue sheet, yes? Okay? If you don't have a blue sheet, I think there's extras in the back. Here's the thing. As I go through this, I will call out the passage reference, right? When I call out the passage reference, that's your cue. Not to raise your hand, but for somebody just to start reading that passage where everyone can hear it. Okay? Everybody understand the rules? All right, let's get going then. All right. Think about this. Let me ask you a question. When you think about God, what comes to your mind? How would you describe God's characteristics, His attributes? Powerful. God is powerful. Good. What else? 
floating. God is big. Good. He's floating? Yeah, I don't know why. God is floating. Well, I mean, maybe so, you know? Okay? I've never heard that before, but we'll go with that. God floats. Okay? And his omniscient is the word. Do what? A word. Omniscient. It's not omniscient. Omniscient is a good one. Yeah. Do you know what it means? Yeah, it means you know everything. Well, it doesn't mean I know everything, but it means God knows everything for sure. Yeah. Not omniscient is knowing all. Right. Knowing all things, God is all-knowing. He's omniscient. What else? What are they, do you know the other two omnis? Uh, okay, omnipotent, or as we say in Mississippi, or omnipotent, right? Either one you want to say. And that means God is what? All-powerful. Omnipresent. He's present everywhere. Very good. Any other ideas about God's character? Yes, ma'am. God is mighty. We sang it this morning. He's mighty to save, right? God is kind. Okay, now we're kind of getting more away from the power, big. That can, now he's also kind. Yes, ma'am. No, yes, sir. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was looking at Andy. What? <laughs> Merciful. Merciful. Very good. Yeah. Uh huh. So oh, there's a Presbyterian. <laughs> God is sovereign. Good. Forgiving. Forgiving. All right. I'm looking for one particular one, and you're not there yet. Loving. He's loving. Good. Merciful. He's merciful. Infinite. Infinite. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, and there's another word for that. Do you know? Perfectionate. Uh, perfectionate. God is perfectionate. Holy. It's kind of like you put on waffles, right? Uh, um, God is what? Holy. He's holy. holy. God is all the things that you said, but He's also holy, holy right? Somebody read Isaiah 6. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Okay, you think about the holiness of God, right? And here we're, here's God in His throne room. Right? That's the picture. Now Isaiah's there. And he sees surrounding God these angels. And, these, and there's smoke that's filling up this room. The foundations are trembling. And the angels are calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Why do you think they repeated it three times? Raise your hand. Anybody know? Yeah. Because God's that holy. Because God is that holy. Very good. What else? What? Trying to get a point across. Because when we try to emphasize something, we do what? We repeat ourselves. Right? So it could very well be for emphasis. It could be for each member of the Trinity. Right? Or it could be, I like this answer, He's that holy. Have you ever tried to say something and you said it one time and you thought, that's just not enough. That's not getting underneath what I'm really meaning and trying to say, what my feelings are about this. That may be where the angels are. They're saying God is He's not just holy. He is holy. 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 Psalm 99 says what? The Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim, let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion. He is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at His footstool. He is holy. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at His holy name. For the Lord our God is holy. You see, he repeats it again three times in that psalm. The Lord our God, He is holy. Alright, now, when we talk about, when the Bible talks about the holiness of God, what does it mean? When we say God is holy, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. He's set apart. Good. Anything else? Perfect. He's perfect. It means that God is absolutely perfect in every way. He is completely perfect. All right, here's my question. Does God expect you to be perfect? How many say no? God does not expect me to be perfect. Raise your hands. Many of you. Many of you. Okay. Peer pressure is now taking effect. Okay. Put your hands down. How many say, oh yeah, God expects me to be perfect? A couple of people. Okay. How many people just say, I don't know. I'm afraid to answer. Okay? A couple of you. Here's the answer. Yes. 
God expects you to be completely perfect. If you're not perfect in every way, God will not accept you. If you're not perfect in every way, you cannot spend eternity with Jesus. God says you have to be perfect. Genesis chapter 2 says what? The Lord God put the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to work it and to and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When you eat of it, you will surely die. Okay, you remember this scene. Right, so travel back to the Garden of Eden. God says, out of all the trees that I've created for you, Adam, there's only one you can't touch. You can't eat of it. Right? The tree of the, yeah, the, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? He says, God says, don't eat of that tree. He required perfect obedience to that command. Right? Because He says, in the day that you eat of it, what will happen? You will surely die. Right? So we required perfect obedience. Well, as we all know, Adam blew it. Adam disobeyed God. He ate of the tree that God said don't eat of. Here's the question, though. After Adam sinned against God, did God soften his demand? Did he change his demand? Did he kind of think, oh, Adam, what was I thinking? I didn't anticipate how weak you really are. Let's do this. I'll give you best two out of three. Is that what God did? No. No, He didn't do that. Even after Adam fell, even after he sinned, God still demanded perfection from Adam and He still demands it from you. Somebody read uh, Genesis 17. Abraham was 99 years old. Um, the Lord everything said, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. And be what? Be blameless. Okay, Leviticus 19. So all my decrees and all my laws and forces, I am the Lord. Keep how many of my decrees? All of them. How many of my laws? All of them. You know what James says in James 2.10? He says, look, if you disobey one of God's laws, you're guilty of all of them. Right? All right, somebody read Matthew 5. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be what? Perfect. Be perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. So even after the fall of man, God is saying to us, you must be perfect. If you're not perfect, you cannot go to heaven when you die. If you are not totally and completely perfect, I can never accept you. Okay? But we look at ourselves and we have to answer then the question, right? Are we perfect? Are you today as holy as God is holy? Are you? No. None of us are. Romans 3.23 says what? We have fallen short. We have sinned against God. It's kind of like in archery, right? You have your bow and arrow and you're shooting at the target, but we're always missing the bullseye. We're missing the mark. Heck, we're missing the whole target, right? And so we see the standard of God, this holy standard. And His holy standard again is what? Perfection. Perfection. Right, and here we are, right? Here's our life. Right? There you are right there. Okay? And here we and we're looking at God's holy standard and we're just thinking to ourselves, it's too far. I can't reach it. No matter how hard I try, no matter what I do to reach that standard, I can't reach that high. We're like the squirrel in Ice Age, always trying to get that acorn, right? We're reaching out for it, right? Trying to get the acorn. And it's like sometimes we almost have it, but we never do. We can never get there. It's the same thing with God's holy standard. Two men were hiking on a mountain one day. One of them was an experienced, older hiker. But because of his age, he had a little bit of arthritis setting uh, into his knee. And so he couldn't get around as good as he used to could. And the other hiker was much younger, an athlete, track star, had once broad jumped 25 feet. 
Very good athlete. Well, as they're hiking on this mountain one day, they got about two-thirds of the way up when suddenly the ground began to shake beneath their feet. And it shook more, and it's my story, there was no rock slide in my story. So the ground is shaking beneath them, and as it's shaking, they realize we're not just hiking on a mountain. We're hiking on an active volcano. And they look at the top of the mountain and they see smoke coming out of the top of this mountain. And it blows. And they see all of this lava begin streaming down the sides of the mountain. And so what do you think they did? Well, heck yeah, they ran. They ran as fast as they could down the mountain trying to get away from that lava. But they came to a point where they were surrounded by the lava streams. Lava streams about 30 feet wide. And they realize the only thing we can try to do is jump over one side of the lava stream. And so the older man went first. He went back as far as he could, looked toward that lava stream, and he ran as fast as he could, and he planted his foot, and he jumped like five feet. And he died in the lava. The younger man, much more athletic, got back as far as he could, ran as fast as he could toward that lava stream, planted his foot, and he jumped 29 and a half feet and died in the lava. Almost! Like a squirrel, but not quite. He died in the lava. Did it matter that one guy could jump further than the other? No. They both died in the lava. In the same way, here you are on one side, and God is on the other. And in between you is this great chasm, this great canyon filled with lava. You can try with everything you've got, you can try to be good enough to do the right things as much as possible in order to make that jump. But can you ever make the jump from here to God? No, you can't. No matter how hard you try, You can't make that... Even if you could wipe away all your past sins, if you somehow had that power, could you from this day forward be righteous enough, do enough right things in your life to make the jump from here to God? Can you? No, you can't. The only way you can make that jump is if you're perfect. It's the only way. There's no amount of good actions that we can do to make up for our sinful condition. Because the problem is not primarily in our actions, is it? Where is our problem? It's in our hearts. We have a heart problem. And there's nothing we can do to fix it. Jeremiah 17 says what? The heart is deceitful above all things. It's beyond cure. Right? And so we see this problem of sin in our hearts. And we kind of go, even if we wanted to fix it, which we usually don't, but even if we wanted to, there's nothing we can do. I can't dig down into my heart and uproot the sin that's inside of me. No matter what I do or how I try. I have a heart problem and there's nothing I can do to fix it. You ever wonder how a worm gets inside an apple? I stay up late at night pondering such questions. You ever wonder that? You would think that the worm eats his way in from the outside, but au contraire. Scientists have discovered the opposite is true. An insect lays an egg inside the apple blossom. And in time, that egg hatches. And the worm eats his way out from the inside. Now think about that next time you eat an apple. It's the same way with sin. Sin doesn't get into our hearts by our actions. Like the more sinful things we do, somehow we then become sinful. Sin starts in our hearts 
and eats his way out into our sinful actions, sinful words, and sinful thoughts. The question is, how did sin get in our hearts to begin with? Romans 5, let me read this one since it's a little bit lengthy. Romans 5, you follow along with me as I read, okay? Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. Again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. That one man is Adam. The judgment followed one sin, Adam's, and brought condemnation. By the trespass of the one man, Adam, death reigned through that one man. The result of one trespass, another word for sin, Adam's, was condemnation for all men. Through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, the many were made sinners. All right, here's what Paul is saying in Romans 5 there. He's saying God created Adam to be our perfect representative. We can't say, all right, if I'd have been in the garden, I wouldn't have done that. I'd have done things a little bit differently. I would have obeyed God. No, you wouldn't. Because God chose Adam to perfectly represent us in the Garden of Eden. So that when he sinned, his sin was immediately applied to us. It was like the whole bloodstream of the human race was contaminated or polluted with sin. Okay? Think about it like this. Why are you an American? Because you were born an American, right? American by birth, Southern by the grace of God, right? So, born an American, right? And so you are an American because your parents were, right? You didn't ask to be an American. You didn't do anything to earn the right to become an American by birth. You were born that way. Who your parents were and what they did impacted you. Or think about it like this. Thomas Jefferson signed the Declaration of Independence with a bunch of other guys, right? You weren't there. You didn't sign it, but it's your declaration of independence today. Nonetheless, Jefferson and the others who signed it acted as your representatives, and their actions have impacted you. It's the same thing with Adam's sin. When he sinned, we sinned in him and fell with him. Again, his sin was immediately applied to us. The whole bloodstream of the human race was polluted with sin. Now, when I was a kid, let me, you know, I was about 10 years old. My parents sent me and my best friend Scott Vernon to a dude ranch. You ever been to a dude ranch? You know what a dude ranch is? It's a ranch with a bunch of dudes. Now, a dude ranch is a place where you go and you get, thank you, and you get your own horse for the whole week. You learn how to groom your horse, how to take care of your horse, how to feed your horse, right? How to saddle your horse. Uh huh. Is this like detention? Because I feel like if you learn that how to farm stuff. Was it detention? No, no, we weren't being sent there because we were bad. No. Now that happened a lot in my life in other ways. In fact, when I graduated eighth grade, you know what they gave me at graduation? A permanent detention hall slip because I'd been in there so much. Lest we digress. Now this is a good thing. A dude ranch. Yeah, it's not like we had numbers and pink suit or you know uh, orange suits. Now this is a good thing. So you're just learning how to take care of your horse. You ride your horse all week long. It was awesome. So my friend and Scott were kind of moseying over to the mess hall for some grub. And uh, as we're waiting in line to go into the mess hall, we see this sign above the door to the mess hall. And I'll never forget what it said. It says, you don't pee in our pool and we won't pee in your milk. (laughs) You don't pee in our pool and we won't pee in your milk. Now I'm telling you, That'll keep you from peeing in the pool. All right, let's say this afternoon you're out here swimming in one of these pools and somebody pees in the pool, right? And they start feeling guilty about it. They get convicted. And they kind of hang their head while they're still in the pool and they just kind of go, I did it. I just peed in the pool. Are you going to stay in the pool? No, why? 
It's contaminated with pee. You're going to get out of the pool, right? One dude pees in the pool, it contaminated the whole pool. I took a youth group down to Mexico one time on a mission trip and we were traveling back. We spent the night in Houston, Texas. And the next morning we were getting breakfast down in the dining hall. And uh, as we were sitting there, I was talking to a student to my left, had another student to my right, and I was enjoying a cup of coffee, right? And we've already discussed, I love coffee. There is no other liquid that I like more on this planet, including water, than coffee. Right? I absolutely love it. And not only do I love coffee, I love it the way God intended it to be drunk. Black. Amen. Right. Amen, brother. Right. I love I don't put sugar in my coffee. I don't add milk or half and half or other contaminants to my coffee. I drink it in its purest form. Black. That's why I have so much hair on my chest. I drink black coffee. So I'm enjoying my black cup of coffee, uh, and I'm talking to this other student, right to my left, about the deep things of Jesus. When unbeknownst to me, this other student, Matt McCraw, is just pouring sugar into my coffee while I'm looking the other way. And so here I am talking to this other one and I bring the coffee to my lips and I drink it and I just spew it in this guy's face. I couldn't stand it. He took my pure black coffee and the sugar contaminated the whole cup. Alright, you get the point. Adam's sin contaminates the whole cup. Adam's sin contaminates the whole pool. Everyone drawn from that contaminated bloodstream, right? Which is everybody born out of that human bloodstream is a sinner. And they're born that way, right? We are born sinners. Psalm 51 says what? Psalm 58 says what? Okay, we're born sinners. It's not like we're sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. Do you see the difference? Right? You see, we are so far off from God's holy standard. It's not even like we're close to reaching this standard. The Bible says that we are spiritually dead, Ephesians 2. It says we're unable to do any spiritual good in God's sight, Romans 3. It says we're not able to please God in any way, Romans 5. Even our best actions are like filthy rags in the sight of God. Isaiah 64. We're not even close to God's holy standard. Here's my question though. Do you really believe that about yourself? I mean, I don't think we do. You know, maybe you're here this week and you didn't grow up in the church. And you're not a Christian and we're so glad you're here. And you're kind of thinking to yourself, you know what, I'm just not that bad. You know, I, I try to do good things. I try to be kind to people. Um, I try to help people. I'm trying really to obey my mom or my dad. I just don't think I'm that bad. Or maybe you did grow up in the church. Been going to church all your life, going to Sunday school. Your parents are Christians. You too try to do kind things. You're trying not to be mean to people. You're trying to obey your parents, do the right things. And kind of what we all think is, you know, the real sinners are thieves and murderers. That's the real sinner. Surely, if I do enough good things in my life, God will overlook my shortcomings. He'll overlook these minor failures in my life. He'll cut me some slack in the end. But to quote a guy by the name of Anselm, you have not considered how great your sin is. You and I are more sinful than we ever dared to believe. You remember Peter? Remember what Jesus said to the disciples before He was about to go and be killed? 
He said to his disciples, you are all going to desert me. All of you will fall away on account of me. In my moment of greatest need, all of you are going to fall away. Satan has demanded to sit you like wheat and you're going to buckle. And Peter stood up, right? Kind of put his chest out. He said, not me, Lord. Not me. Everyone else may leave you. But not me. I'll die before I leave you. And then what did Peter proceed to do? He denied he even knew Jesus. Not once. Not twice. But three times. Peter had not considered how great his sin really was. That he was more sinful in his heart than he ever dared to believe. That's the way it is with all of us. We're more sinful than we ever dared to believe. See, what's most important about our lives is this. It doesn't matter how you see yourself. It matters how God sees you. And God in the Bible right, tells us He sees us as sinners, as people who have rebelled against Him. Now here's my question to you. Does God look at the sin in your life and just kind of wink at it? Just kind of laugh it off. It's kind of cute. Is that what He does? No. God sends people to hell over the sins in their lives. Right? God's standard is perfection. We can't earn that perfection. No matter how hard we try, we can't make that jump. And we deserve hell because of our imperfection. I want you to turn in your Bibles to a passage that I don't have in your outlines. And it is 2 Thessalonians 1. We're going to read this. We'll say a couple of things and we'll be done. Okay, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And I'm going to read verses 7 through 9. Okay, do you know where 2 Thessalonians is? It's right after 1 Thessalonians. Everybody got it? It's in the New Testament. Go visit Timothy and hang a right. Or a left, I'm sorry. 2 Thessalonians 1. I'm going to start reading in the middle part of verse 7. The Lord Jesus... Now listen, if you don't have your Bible, just listen to me real close. This is a real important passage. The Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution, judgment, right, punishment to those who do not know God, to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Does that passage sound like God winks at sin? Does it sound like He kind of just laughs it off. No, it's something for which He sends people to hell. And not just the marquee sins, right? Not just the sins that we think are really bad. It says that Jesus is coming back with His angels in flaming fire one day to deal out retribution, to deal out punishment, to deal out judgment to people who don't obey the Gospel. There was this minister who was traveling to a city where he had a meeting one morning. He's in the downtown part of the city. And he couldn't find a parking spot, right? He circled the block ten times. Couldn't find one. Finally, he parked in a no-parking zone. Wrote a note out on a sheet of paper. He said, I've circled this block ten times. I have a meeting. Forgive us our trespasses. And he put it under the windshield wiper of the car. 
went to his meeting, came back out, and he saw his note still underneath that windshield wiper, and attached to it was a pink slip, a ticket, with another note attached to the pink slip. And the note was from that police officer. And he said, I've been circling this block for ten years. If I don't give you a ticket, I lose my job. Lead us not into temptation. Uh (laughs) Now that policeman showed no partiality to that minister. And he didn't cut him a break. He gave him what he deserved. In the same way, unless, listen, unless we are totally perfect when we stand before God one day, He will show us no partiality. He will not give us a break. He will not cut us any slack. If we're not totally perfect, meaning we've never thought a sinful thought. We've never said a sinful word. We've never done a sinful action. Ever. Not one. Unless we're totally perfect. When we stand before God one day, God will look at us and He will say this, Depart from me. I never knew you. Depart from me. We're still in our first class. Get out of here. (laughs) Depart from me. I never knew you. Gang, if you're not perfect, God will throw you into hell. If you're not perfect, you can't spend forever with Jesus. If you're not perfect, He will deal out retribution to you. He will never accept you. I wonder, if I keep your papers quiet, I wonder, answer this in your own heart. How does that make you feel? What questions does it raise in your own heart? If it bothers you, that idea, if you're not perfect, you can't be with Jesus when you die, I want you to talk to your youth leaders about it today. Let's pray. Our Father in Heaven, help us to see how high Your standard is. That You have actually demanded something from us we can't provide. And it makes us feel hopeless and helpless. You demand that we be perfect to be with You forever. Help us to understand what that means. And help us to see, Lord, is there any hope out there for us? In Jesus' name, Amen. Y'all go to your second class.